Thank you for tuning in to Hill Country Fellowship's audio podcast. We hope you're encouraged and inspired as you listen today. As we celebrate uh, this amazing day in history, Jesus dying on the cross, and then this day in history, coming to life again after paying for the sins of every human being ever so that we could be forgiven, free, free forever. Amen. Isn't that good news? Man, Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, more than enough to meet every need you'll ever have, solve every problem that ever comes, restore the impossible, and make everything right that matters in life. So our big idea today is that Jesus redeems and restores. We're in this series, Redeemer. Um, And last week we looked at how Jesus clears the path. He clears the stage. He clears the the junk that that maybe we put in our own lives that separate us from God or that other people maybe pile on and we just kind of live in that. But uh, we looked at that that temple scene um, that happened uh, on, you know, on Easter week or Holy Week um, where he just clears the tables, drove people out so that you could have full and free and unlimited access to God. Next week, we're going to look at what it means to live a transformed life as he redeems and restores us and and live out of this uh, abundant life he gives. And then today, we're going to look at what it means to be redeemed and restored for us and redeemed and restored from us for others. We're going to look at John's gospel account of that most amazing story. We're going to apply some of Paul's wisdom for what it means to live this out. And then we're going to hear a real life, Jesus still resurrects the impossible story from some of our very own here uh, in our church family. And here's the thing, the resurrection story that we celebrate today is the story. Everything from creation up until that point led up to it. Everything from from that Sunday morning revelation that Jesus was alive again has been about it up until this very hour and every hour that will go on. He's the reason we live. God made us. He's the the reason life matters and we have hope because Jesus saves us. He's the reason we have right relationship with God. Jesus redeemed us and made that right. And then and then he he, he brought us back and bought us back and restored us in our own lives, and he's still in process. As, as we're perfect and holy and, and blameless now, he's still making us perfect and holy and blameless along the way. Only Jesus gets to do that. Only Jesus can do that. He promised us. He guarantees us. Jesus guarantees us eternal life with him if we choose to believe in and follow him. So this story is the story. And our redeemed and restored lives are meant to, meant to tell it as we live out following Jesus and, and loving other people and living on mission. How we live and what we share and as we just share our story or we share hope or we, we share community or we invite people into, into community life or we invite them to church or we just, we just care for them, whatever they're going through in life. That tells the story because you're living for someone else because of the spirit of the living God in you. Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection defines everything that really matters. All the craziness of the world, the confusion that exists, pain, wondering, the stuff of life that just happens as we live life, it can all be settled and made peaceful by us really understanding, really getting the resurrection, what that means, believing and living from the truth that Jesus' resurrection is my resurrection. For those who believe in Jesus, Jesus' resurrection is your resurrection. You will never die. You'll just go from here, one breath, eternity, the next. You will never feel the pain of death or the sting of the grave. That's a promise that's made to us. If we could bring back all of those who've gone on to heaven to be with Jesus, who passed away, they'd all be like, he's right. He's right. I didn't feel it. In fact, it got better. 
Might have been fearful in the last moments of that breathing, but wow, totally worth it. He comes true because he is truth. So we're going to look at parts of John 19 and 20 and, and his account of that, starting with verse 28 of chapter 19. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, and they soaked it with sponge and put it on a hyssop branch, held it up to his lips. When Jesus tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and released his spirit. Jesus died. No heartbeat. Human being, fully man, dead, gone. It was the day of preparation, and the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies hanging around there the next day, which was the Sabbath. Uh, at least they stayed true to form, and they didn't want anything looking wrong. Who cares about dead people and their families? Get them down. So they stayed, you know, consistent. It was a very special Sabbath because it was the Passover. So they asked Pilate to hasten their deaths by ordering that their legs be broken. So they're still alive on the crosses, and they didn't want them to hang around that long. So they went and they would break their legs so they would suffocate quicker, and they would die within moments. So the soldiers came, broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus, but when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water flowed out. This report is from an eyewitness given an accurate account. He speaks the truth so that you can also believe, just in case you need that. These things happened in fulfillment of the scriptures that say not one of his bones will be broken, and they will look on the one they pierced. The mission was finished. Jesus did everything that was ever needed for us to be redeemed and restored. Redeemed meaning by back, restored meaning, actually biblically restored meaning, uh, means better than it once was. So it's, it's the way it's meant to be. There's a lot going on here. There's big and specific prophecies that are fulfilled, some hundreds of years old, some even thousands of years old. The death of the creator God by the creation, the weight of that punishment was so much more severe than merely dying. I mean, the reason that Jesus was so emotionally and physically stressed and exhausted in that garden scene from a few days before where we read that he, he either sweated what looked like drops of blood or he might have actually sweated blood. But he was realizing, I am going to become the most sinful being ever. Never sinned but became the most sinful being ever because he took on the sins of all mankind in one moment. So that stress and that pressure and that guilt and that heaviness on the cross is probably what ended his life faster than those two on either side of him. I mean, just imagine it. Imagine the worst thing you've ever done. Don't say it out loud. The worst thing you've ever done. Even though you're forgiven, you probably still cringe, Right? Some of us, we can think of, well, I got a top 10. I don't even know which one to pick. So you got your worst thing you've ever done. Add to it everything, every sin you've ever committed. That's a lot. Add to that the sins of roughly 90 billion people that have ever existed on the planet. 90 billion people's sins. Some of the worst crimes you could ever fathom. And in one millisecond, Jesus bore the weight of all of that. For us, willingly and joyfully. He became a curse on a tree so you could be bought back and restored. So you could be free of paying for that sin on your own because there's a cost to it. There's a payment due and you can't pay it. Only he can. So a spotless lamb, him, had to go and be sacrificed the beautiful thing was in, in history past, before that moment, 
it was always like a kind of a holding, like they, was, they would sacrifice a lamb and it was kind of, well, you're held, you're held clean until next year at this time. Jesus was once and for all on the cross, died because you're loved. He died because you're loved. I was singing uh, first service after I preached and I just felt like I just heard God say, Scott, remember he died because you're loved. Not died because you were a sinner, although, yeah, he died because you're loved. That's why he went there. That's why he was excited in a joyful way, not maybe necessarily excited for the pain, but because of the reward. He didn't suffer and die for us to simply have a good example. That guy's good. He didn't bear the weight of sin so that we could learn how to power through. And Jesus powered through. I got to power through tough times. That is not why he bore that. Jesus became the curse so that the power and the effect of sin and death could be broken once and for all, so that everyone lost could be found and come home, so that everyone who walked away could be brought back, bought back, restored fully, so that everyone disconnected from God could be adopted and have a forever family, so that everyone dead to sin And maybe there's somebody in here, you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, to believe in and follow him, so you would be considered right now dead to sin, but here's the thing, he hung on the cross and he forgave sin so that those dead to sin could be resurrected with him to new life, and you have that opportunity today. In Ephesians chapter two, Paul tells us that that we were once dead because of sin, that we lived against God. We were anti-Christ in living against God at one time. But God, but God. I love then God, but God, but Jesus moments. But God's mercy and love was so much, Paul says, that he gave us life when he raised Jesus from the dead. We were resurrected. God saved you by his grace upon believing. It's this eternal gift that God has packaged for you. We all know what Christmas is like. We all know that it has gifts. Typically, they're wrapped. Since that moment when Jesus rose from the dead, the gift was wrapped for every individual person that would ever exist. And God comes and he, just like a parent, you know, he had that best gift you've ever gotten your kid. You can't wait to see their face. God can't, can't wait to see the face of someone who finally opens it for the first time. And he says, life, eternally, me and you in relationship. He gets excited about that, and it's for you. And what do we do with the gift? We tear it open, and it's ours. We don't earn it. We don't pay for it. We don't even have to continue to keep the gift in our possession. It's ours, a free gift of grace. In John 19, 34 that we read, it's a lot of cool stuff to fully unpack what that means, but we're not gonna do that today. Um, But I will ask you this, if you'll commit to do life with us, and maybe you're a guest here, you're visiting uh, for the holidays or whatever, I, I, I challenge anyone who doesn't have a home church a community of believers to to call their own, I challenge you to be in community, be in a life-giving, life-bringing, spirit-led church so that you can grow together and learn about the the, the word of God together and how to live it out. So we're not gonna talk about all that, that the blood and the water means, but I promise you if you make this church your church, We'll unpack it together and you'll, you'll see, you'll hear even, even other things that are wild and crazy like uh, when we sing the song, I think later on we'll sing a song about dead people walking around on that day. Yeah. We'll unpack that for you, but not today. But here's the thing with that moment, that blood equals forgiven. Jesus redeems you. That water equals cleanse. Jesus restores you. The blood for the forgiveness of sin, the the water for the cleansing of your soul, your heart, your life. You're clean before him. He redeems you and he restores you. Moving on into John chapter 20, we see Resurrection Sunday. We see that empty tomb that they found. We, 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 We see the story of kind of what I read from Matthew at the at the beginning of the service. But what I want to do is is look specifically at at verses 19 through 23 and the peace Jesus brings. 
That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. They're scared. They're hiding out. Personally, I'm not sure if Jesus walking through walls was the best thing for that moment for them uh, in their fear, but it did get their attention. And I know that there's times that Jesus just needs to get our attention. I've had those moments when he's had a, an arrested moment, a, a in-my-face moment, a shocker moment. And when I, when I think about it, I'm like, yeah, I would have rather you just come along and been like, hey, Scott, hey, buddy, and put your arm around me. But Jesus is like, yeah, you wouldn't have listened, so I need to shock you and walk through the walls in your fear and stand among you and say, peace, be still. Luke said that they thought it was a ghost. They're freaked out. Anyone here freaked out about how life's playing out for you? You just can't fathom what's going to happen or what's going to be. You, can't, you just can't wrap your mind around anything being reckoned positively. Anybody nervous for your kids? Like, you're already nervous enough just raising them and being a parent, but then the world out there? Anybody worried about their marriage? How it's feeling, how it's going, what it's looking like? Anybody numb? After seeing the doctor, talking to your boss, and you're just like, I just want to go veg. I don't want to face it. Anybody confused about this world? Good night. How can you not be? Maybe you're actually unwilling to even stop and feel you're running so fast because you're running so hard because that's how you get things done. And you will not rest because it's all up to you. Peace be with you, Jesus says. Just look to Jesus. Remember what he did on the cross. Let the joy of the reality of your salvation fill you up. When you see an empty cross, when you see an empty tomb, when you realize he'd walk through walls just to say peace, understand that his presence in your life is what brings peace. That's the only way. You can try to manufacture peace, find peace, create peace your own. It, it's all going to be fraudulent and fake. It's going to be temporary at best. His presence brings peace. It's the only way. Peace be with you, he says a second time. Some of us need to hear it, a, a, you know, a 20-second time. He says, the Father sent me to do this mission of ending sin's hold and bringing forgiveness forever. And now, I'm sending you. You're my witnesses, you're the one that declares, I redeem, and I can always restore. In Ephesians 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul goes on to say that, that you used to have no idea about God, and you lived without purpose and without hope, pre-Jesus. And then in verse 13 and 14, Paul says, but now... You have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united the Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down that wall of hostility that separated us. The far from God 
are brought near by Jesus. You don't have to hunt for him. He's there to take you. Jesus brought you his peace. And that stress, that distress, that pain, that worry, that anxiety, he brings you his peace. Walls that blocked things are now brought down. Here in this point, what Paul's saying is the Jews and Gentiles, they had hostility between them and Jesus, he, he removed that and he reckoned it. For us, it might be within our own family or, or, or somebody in the community or it may be some kind of a people group, but, uh, but whatever it was that was a wall that blocked, a wall that created hostility, Jesus wiped it clean. He rendered it ineffective and useless. So in that, in that John passage, we read that Jesus empowers them and he empowers us when he breathed on them to live this spirit-filled, spirit-led life, to do all he would do to see others redeemed, forgiven, restored, healed. We have that same resurrection spirit, resurrection power, in us. So nothing at all is impossible. No issue of life is outside of his reach. Nothing you face is beyond Jesus' ability to fix. So what I would like you to hear is a real life story from some of our very own today where Jesus had to intervene to resurrect what was once dead and obviously seemed impossible to everyone around him except Jesus knows what to do. So would you welcome to the stage Mike and Teresa Tangora as they share their resurrection story in Jesus. Morning. I'm Mike Tangora, and this is my beautiful bride, Teresa Tangora. Um, I was born and raised in Houston, and uh, my childhood was pretty rough. Um, I ended up living on the streets, ran away from the, uh, the home where there was nothing but abuse, and uh, God wasn't in my life then. Me and Teresa met. Uh, waiting tables shortly after I graduated high school, had a family. Uh, we had one child, and uh, there was an event that occurred in our marriage that just wrecked us, absolutely just darkened the doorway. It brought back all those traumatic events back to my mind. I ended up shutting down and, and withdrawing completely. I wasn't a husband, I wasn't a father at the time, just, just lived in darkness. I spent so much of my life being insecure, um, trying to please my mom and get the love and attention that I wanted, and it was just never good enough. And so when we got married, uh, my identity was wrapped up in being a wife because I felt like I finally had somewhere I belonged and I could put all of my energy into that. And someone was accepting and loving all of the efforts that I made. And when our world fell apart um, and Mike shut down, I didn't know who I was anymore. And I went and I sought that identity elsewhere. And it absolutely broke us. We were done. Our friends stood on the sidelines and watched our marriage just burn to the ground. And um, I left. I moved to East Texas and got a job and started my life over again. We were done. Marriage was completely over. So she was gone about three or four, maybe five months uh, separation. I ended up finding a, uh, a pastor that could counsel the both of us. So she ended up returning home, what, about a year after or so? It wasn't quite that long, but yeah, we, we managed to kind of piece things together. The Lord kind of orchestrated some events that made us realize that we needed to be back together. 
um, we started going and seeing the, counsel, the, the pastor, and he was counseling us, and it was the first time that anyone um, had fought for us and our marriage and our family. And um, that was in January, and a few months later, we found out we were pregnant with our second child, and we were so happy, so thrilled that we kind of looked at that as God giving us a promise that our marriage was going to be restored, it was going to be redeemed, and um, things were moving forward. We were doing things completely differently than we had, and we were in church finally. And about October of that year, um, Mike found a local church that was very close to home and wanted us to go. And um, I was very reluctant because it was non-denominational. It wasn't what I was familiar with. But the first Sunday we walked in, the pastor and his wife were doing a, seri a message on extreme biblical marriage. And he had his wife come up and talk on stage. And... Um, it was the first time in my life I ever heard God speaking to me through that marriage. And I bawled through the whole thing. But um, the people in that church started loving on us and inviting us to come to group and get into community. And when we had our baby a couple months later, um, we suddenly had people coming to our door and bringing us food and showing up to love on us and um, showing us the kind of love that we, did, we had not experienced, that we didn't know um, we didn't have any family around, and they just loved on us like we were their family. Because of the men of the church, um, brought life into me, revived our marriage, revived who I was, a father, a husband, a friend, and it was because of the church. We're here 25 years later, <laughs> celebrating. I just, I invite anyone out there that's walking in darkness, that's uh, living in sin, that's lonely, that's hurting, just please show up. Let people b just breathe life back into you. Let, uh, let the, the blood of Jesus just pour over you and heal you. And I also want to encourage those of you who are walking in faith, you're, you're comfortable with your relationship with Jesus. Look around you and find someone who is struggling, who let, let him show you someone who is needing that and reach out to them because you might just be able to save a life, save a marriage, save a family like people did for us. Thank you. You carry the redeeming and restoring power of Jesus in your life if he is your king, your Lord, and your savior, to, to see the lost redeemed, to see the, uh, the wayward restored to new life, to see brokenness restored to wholeness, to bring peace where it's needed. There's a lot of people out there lack peace in their lives. By virtue of having the spirit of the living God in us, we carry the peace that passes understanding with us. Maybe like the, the Tangoras were all those years ago, that's what you need today. A, a resurrection story, something to be restored and made right, or a peace brought back into your life to, to become his for the first time, or, or maybe his again. Maybe you just found yourself kind of on the sidelines you look and Jesus is at a distance and you're like, I once was right there. I'm telling you, he, he never gets mad at you. He wants you. He longs for a relationship, but he's not frustrated at you for, for failing. He just says, hey, come home. Come home. Maybe you need the peace that overcomes everything negative in life to fill you. My prayer for all of us is that, that we'd fully understand the power of the resurrection, that it redeems and restores it for us and for, for others. I want to take a moment and, and give an invitation to pray for those who don't know Jesus. Or maybe those who would say, I need to recommit. I, 
I once had a relationship. I don't know what it is right now, but I do know it's not what it should be. So whether you call it recommitment or rededication or prodigal coming home, it doesn't matter. All that matters is you, you want Jesus. If you're here today, you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, and you find yourself going, I want forgiveness of sins. I want peace that passes understanding. I want to be restored and brought into right relationship with God. I want eternal life, guaranteed. If you want that today, it's there for you. Would you you just close your eyes for a moment? If that's you, and you would say, I need Jesus, or I need Jesus again, would you just raise up your hand real quick, just so I can see you? I want to be able to pray for you. There's nothing magical about raising your hand, but there's something powerful about it. If that's you, we'll give you just a couple more moments. Just, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. I want what you did at the cross to apply to me. Or Jesus, I want to come home. Would you take this dirty, downtrodden, wayward son, daughter back? If that's you, know that he says yes and that he wants you. So we're just going to pray for you real quick before we pray for all of us. (laughs) Jesus, thank you for going to the cross. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for for bleeding, giving your body, giving your blood so we could be made whole and be forgiven of sin. Thank you for not requiring us to earn anything but saying it's a gift of salvation for all time. I pray for everyone in this room that raised their hand, whether to come for the first time or come home, that they would be encouraged by heaven today even realizing that scripture tells us that every time a, 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 a sinner repents that, that you rejoice, you have a party in heaven for that. And there's a lot of parties going on right now. Not a celebration. I pray that they would know that they are celebrated. They would never feel shame anymore. Shame off of you, Jesus says. They would never feel like they need to earn something. That is not for you. It is a gift given that they would be filled with the spirit of the living God to have that comforter and that counselor in them. And I pray that they would pray this prayer that Paul gives us, confessing with their mouth, saying, Jesus, I believe. Believing in their heart that you raised them, you raised Jesus from the dead God and you raised them up again. I pray that they would know this to be true that anyone who trusts in Jesus will never be disgraced and that everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. And I thank you that that's true of them now for all eternity. And you are theirs and they are yours. We bless them. I honor them for that decision. And I know you're excited for it, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Paul also goes on to say, How can they call on Jesus unless they believe? And how can they believe unless they hear? And how can they hear unless someone goes? So that's the opportunity for us. And so I'm going to ask you to stand right now. And we're going to pray for those opportunities to come. We're going to pray for those opportunities for Jesus to lead us to them, for Jesus to lead them to us, for Jesus to say, hey, go. This is a big moment, and I'm not going to just magically make it happen around you. Sometimes he, he, you know, he mysteriously does that, but oftentimes he says, hey, go over there, talk, share, say, love, invite, invest. But the, we, would, we would desire those opportunities. Jesus does the work. The Holy Spirit does, does the empowerment, but we are the messengers. It is why Jesus said, My job here is done. I killed death. Your job is to go. And when he said, when you forgive their sins, they'll be forgiven. And if you don't forgive their sins, they won't be forgiven. He wasn't saying you have the power of God there. He was saying you share the message. And they can't hear unless you tell them. They won't know a miracle story unless you share yours. 
So I'm gonna ask you right now, if you wanna be the messenger, if you wanna step into that moment whenever it comes along of just being Jesus to people, I'm gonna ask you right now just to put your hands out and receive. And if you believe in and follow Jesus and you don't want that, I I think you need to have a reckoning moment tonight with Jesus. But if you would, just, just receive right now. I'm gonna pray. Jesus, I thank you for all that you did. I thank you that you're the forgiver of sins. You're the restorer of the broken. You're the redeemer of mankind. You clear the way for us to to be in relationship with God. I thank you that that, uh, there's nothing that can stop the work of your life from our lives. And, And I pray you help us be the messengers, that we would be like Paul says to be that we'd be willing, we'd go, we'd share, we'd speak, we'd invite, we'd love on, we'd be grace givers. We would be grace dispensers and not people that sneer at other people. We would look for the most broken and we desire to bring wholeness and know that it's not on us to do that. We just step into what you create for us to do. So I pray every messenger in this room would see the opportunities, seek out the opportunities, and step into the opportunities to be messengers for the living God who's a victorious warrior on our behalf. In your name we pray, amen. For more messages and full services, visit hcfburnit.org or the Church Center app and connect with us on social media.